All right, well, why don't we go ahead and get started. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Dan Brown, the director in the School of Environmental and Forest Sciences. Happy to welcome you to another in our weekly CEF seminar series. And we have um, one of our own presenting today. Um, this is the first in our little mini series on uh, celebrating promotions. Um, we're here to congratulate Monica Mosco on her promotion to full professor in the school. So congratulations. Um, we're really glad that you're here and that you're uh, presenting your work to us today and um, sharing the stage with uh, Megan Halabisky. So Monica is um, the associate director in the school for research programs. She is the director of the Remote Sensing and Geospatial Analysis Laboratory in CEFS and also director of the Precision Forestry Cooperative, which is a, a cooperative founded in 1999 as part of the Washington State Advanced Technology Initiative funded by the uh, Washington State Legislature. And the mission of the PFC is to develop advanced technologies to improve the quality and reliability of information needed for planning, implementation, and monitoring of natural resource management to ensure sustainable management. And uh, Monica has been the director for some time. <laughs> I don't know the actual 2013. number. 2013. Since 2013. And has, um, got the programs of that uh, cooperative. One of the bragging points that I'll brag about her is that uh, for every dollar from the legislature, they're bringing in $10 in research funds, and maybe it's even more at this point. So um, lots of research activity, and we're going to hear about um, some of the work today in a talk entitled Adventures in Remote Sensing, Linking Forest and Wetland Carbon Through Remote Sensing. Take it away, Monica. Great, thank you, Dan. Well, every story has a beginning, and this one starts with social me media and me posting a story about NASA uh, putting $10 million back towards the NASA Carbon Monitoring System program. And that was in March 2019. I was really excited. And you'll notice Dan Brown uh, jumped in and said, maybe we should be working on a proposal. And uh, you'll notice that Megan Halabisky liked it, which is a big deal because, um, you know, sometimes getting encouragement is really important. Encouragement from your peers and mentors and seeing your colleagues interested in ideas is also important. So I attribute the beginning to all the story I'm going to present today to that um, social media post. Every story also has a prelog, so I wanted to give you a little bit of a context of where I'm coming from um, to this research project that I'm going to talking about. And I'm really weaving a story that uh, has about three dynamics dimensions here. One is the water hydrology dimension, the one in the center is the human dimension, and then the forest canopy dimension. And uh, when I look back, I realize that along the lines of the forest uh, canopy th dimension, as early as 1991, uh, I joined the Environmental Youth Corp in Canada and got a chance to fly around Northern Ontario and look down at the forests to look at post forest fire tree planting assessments. Uh, shortly thereafter, I went to uh, the University of Waterloo and started my undergraduate degree in environmental sciences and start to take remote sensing classes. And a lot of my remote sensing classes at the time were from a geomorphology perspective. So kind of starting to weave in that hydrology dimension and looking at the, the landscape from aerial photography. As every undergraduate, I had uh, a moment where I thought, hmm, maybe I'll do something else and seriously considered going to law school and actually ended up for a year at the British Institute of International and Comparative Law at the University of London, thinking that I was gonna study uh, international environmental law, 
which I realized the discipline didn't exist at the time. Uh, luckily, I went actually yesterday to the website of Bickle, and they do have an international environmental law program now. Well, I did change my mind. I got a job and for a year worked in Northern Ontario looking at water quality. Um, so I was an environmental engineer and eventually decided that really I just wanted to go to grad school and study remote sensing and ended up doing that in Alberta, Canada, looking at forest inventories, wildlife habitat and biodiversity. And then moved on to my PhD and studied um, in the United States, looking at Yellowstone National Park and post-fire regeneration and looking how remote sensing could help us monitor what was ecologically uh, happening on the landscape. Um, eventually, I made my way to the University of Washington. I arrived in 2006 and uh, started to take on projects along that um, water hydrology dimension with forest delineation projects, wetland mapping. Um, Megan joined me uh, on some of these projects and you'll hear us talking about that in a little while. And even uh, looking at radar and how to uh, incorporate that into mapping. I also um, dabbled in the urban dimension specifically through looking at urban canopy cover mapping, high resolution canopy cover, cover mapping. And really the bulk of my work um, has been looking at the forest canopy dimension and bringing in quite a few projects along those lines. Today, I'm just gonna be talking about this teal carbon project. But what's unique about it is that you see that these three threads are now starting to combine. And that's really exciting to me to be able to do that in my career. And of course, uh, I don't just stop there. I, uh, I have other things going on as well that you won't hear me talk about, uh, including next week, iPhone is gonna have a LiDAR sensor in it, um, as well as other co collaborations where I bring in my remote sensing skill set to the school. And I wanna add that, these threads, I'm not showing you everything. Here in the background, you see all of the world cloud of what my research uh, incorporates. The additional threads are additional ideas. And I think what's important is with all of these additional ideas, there comes a new person, new student, new collaboration, which is really exciting to, uh, to me. And notice also that the thread grows stronger through those things. The second thing I want to do is give you my philosophy of remote sensing. Uh, and it includes uh, looking at remote sensing from the um, remote sensing domain perspective. So remote sensing has entered an era of hyper resolution where we have the spatial resolution and that includes unoccupied aerial systems, aerial uh, photogrammetry, digital photogrammetry, space-borne and airborne um, lasers, including terrestrial lasers, radar, and so on. All of those things are spatial. Notice some of them include structural 3D information as well. Temporal component, the frequency of observations that remote sensing can do. And then the spectral component, capturing physiological like health of vegetation or morphological information like species differences from remote sensing. From, for all of these domains, there's uh, trade-offs and there are cost analysis time and accuracy that you need to think about. But to me, what I think is really exciting is that all of them can be fused. So you can fuse the domains and uh, reap the benefits of synergies of using multiple domains of remote sensing. And I do still think remote sensing is a discipline that has a ways to go along the access equity and inclusion um, axes. And as a female remote sensing scientist, I've experienced that all throughout my career. And as a good remote sensing scientist, I haven't mentioned the fourth resolution, but I will tell you uh, that that resolution of um, quantization uh, 
does relate to all the other resolution. And often um, you don't have actually a lot of control over it. So I don't talk about that resolution a lot in my uh, philosophy, but it's there. Of course, with remote sensing, what we want to do is optimize uh, or uh, utilize the best all of all these three resolutions, but because of the trade-offs, most projects end up doing something like this, where if uh, you optimize one, you might lose on another and you kind of have to make a call. Often, actually, a lot of remote sensing just utilizes one domain of remote sensing resolution, and that's where, what I actually stay away from. I do want to utilize multiple domains. Okay, you saw some uh, work and I'm just gonna set some context here. A lot of my research, uh, more than half of my publications, so plus 30 publications, looks at inventories and structure in heterogeneous forests. And I look at forests from an ecosystem view, not a productivity uh, view. And I find that heterogeneous forests are exciting to work on because they're hard to model. So uh, there's a lot of work to be done there. There's a lot of uncertainty and measuring that uncertainty is important. Uh, one of the things that I've really enjoyed developing through my career is looking at leaf area index and how to scale that leaf and area index in these special difficult to work in environments. And of course, fusion of remote sensing really comes to play here because heterogeneous forests are hard to work on and being able to uh, fuse multiple domains of remote sensing is where things get really, uh, really exciting. And that's where we have trade-offs as well. So lots of collaborators, lots of support and uh, sort of a strong area of research in my program. Relating it to uh, tying the below ground carbon, uh, well, first we can look at above ground uh, biomass, which is really a proxy for above ground uh, carbon. Here, what you're looking at is um, a map that we've produced looking at above ground um, forest density and forest height. And especially what's interesting is when you start to look at these densities along the National uh, Wetland Inventory and notice that the variability in the landscape is also captured in the data within these uh, buffers along the uh, wetland um, inventory maps. Uh, one of the things that we can do here is also leverage the data that we've collected from the Precision Forestry Co-op. So what you see here is uh, our stratification and data, um, field plot data selection to do these above ground uh, biomass assessments for a variety of forest conditions from uh, edge effects to stands with fully grown in canopies. The second component looking at wet landscapes and uh, some of the work there includes wetlands and tidal flats. This is where Megan Halibisky comes in and many other collaborators as well that Megan and I both have uh, worked with. So it's been really enjoyable. Some funding and publication success as well. What we've learned here is that uh, heterogeneous structure from LIDAR can help us detect invasive species, spe specifically invasive seagrasses on tidal flats. Megan Halibisky has shown that hyperspectral uh, or hyperspatial uh, remote sensing allows for delineation on wetlands. And then we've worked with other students like Chris Vondrasek and Yukio Endo from Japan to apply those same ways of thinking on uh, aerial photos, but also uh, radar data. 
the spectral domain tools, when you're playing in this toolbox with these multiple domains of remote sensing, you develop new tools. And sometimes you realize that a spectral domain tool can actually effectively be applied to a multi-temporal domain tool. So a time series of late uh, Lensat can utilize subpixel water estimation, really the bulk of Megan's PhD. Um, and of course, the temporal domain for wetlands allows us to think about type and function through hydrographs of those wetlands. And here, what you're looking at, again, is a product. Uh, this is uh, a wetland uh, probability map for a watershed near Mount Rainier called Michelle. You can see we're achieving really high accuracies on these maps when we visually interpret them, go on the ground, or even work with our stakeholders, uh, others who study wetlands. And more importantly, what you also see is that these uh, wet probability areas extend way beyond the national, national wetland inventory. And you can see that through their function, so variability in uh, temporal observations, we can see that some of these wets, wetlands are isolated, others are stream fed, and potentially we can separate them as well. So bringing all of that together, uh, teal carbon, stakeholder-driven monitoring forest, uh, forested landscapes, and wetland carbon. This is a project um, that um, we got funding from, from NASA, $575,000 going directly to the University of Washington. And we started the project officially in January 2020. Uh, multiple collaborators, uh, Megan being uh, the lead with me on this, uh, David Butman, David Harvey, Chad Bobcock, actually a past a PhD student of mine who studies and uh, deals with uncertainty in uh, remote sensing and now is an assistant professor at University of uh, Minnesota, as well as a new PhD student that we brought on, Anthony Stewart, and uh, Maureen uh, Duane, who's the project manager for our project. So uh, terrestrial wetlands are actually the largest reservoir of carbon in North America, with roughly half of wetland area occurring in forested systems. We refer to this carbon as teal carbon based on work by um, Amanda Nalik from 2016. While forested wetlands are long-term carbon sinks and important in global carbon accounting, they have received relatively little research attention and therefore are a significant source of uncertainty in carbon inventories and monitoring system. So our study is the first to combine remote sensing tools and field observation, uh, as well as harvest records to assess wetland disturbances, focusing on harvest over multiple decades. And you can see here what that looks like from a remote sensing perspective, land trender uh, series over actually one of our study sites, the whole river on the Olympic Peninsula. Our research questions for the project. So the figure is complex. It's a large project, but our research questions are embedded into our um, steps that we're working on and hierarchically build on one another, starting with what are the current stocks of total carbon above ground and below ground for forested wetlands in the PNW? Uh, are the variations in carbon stored in forested wetlands across precipitation gradients? So we actually designed the project going from west to east of the state following uh, a wetness, um, what we call a wetness this gradient to be able to capture that. How does hydraulic position of wetlands connected or disconnected from surface flow impact total carbon storage? And do fr frequency and legacy forest harvest practices inside forested wetlands impact carbon storage capacity across different ecosystem types? 
think what's important to recognize here is these are hierarchical, they're embedded, and most importantly, they rely on partnerships through the PFC and partnerships that start not at the end of the project, but even before we um, got started. So where are we at? We finish our wetland uh, maps for our study sites uh, through a wetland probability tool. And you can see these are highly accurate. The darker the blue area, the higher the probability of a wetland. We're also uh, looking to tie the above ground uh, biomass to teal carbon. And we got really lucky with a proposal to the same program that we were funded at, where collaborators under Andy Hudak's proposal, which is allowing us to evaluate uh, some of the products that he's produced producing and utilize them in designing our field protocol. I'm going to bring in a collaborator here. So here's a major hurdle we encountered when developing a wet carbon sampling design was that we knew we would only be able to collect a low number of samples. Digging soil pits is very labor intensive, so we could only reasonably expect to sample one or two locations in a day. And at least for this summer, we had to deal with a truncated field season and additional COVID-19 uh, protocols that kept us safer, but also reduced the number of locations we would be able to sample this season. We needed to make sure our sampling design was as efficient as possible. By efficient, we mean that we needed to best capture the full range of wet carbon variability across the landscape with a low number of field samples. To pull this off, we incorporated our wetland intrinsic potential map into a systematic random sampling design that ensured our field samples would be spread evenly across the range of wetland potentials in the region and still adhere to sound design-based statistical sampling principles. All right, so that was Dr. Chad Babcock talking about our sampling design. Um, here is what we're planning for next year, starting in January. So we'll use the Hudak maps, but we're going to try and improve on them, essentially throwing the kitchen sink at them of uh, structural remote sensing to see if we can improve riparian forest above ground biomass, because we know that will improve our below ground uh, biomass as well. Um, and of course, stakeholders. So the underlying theme of the stakeholder engagement and interaction plan is to have a holistic integration to promote informed management decision making for coordinated actions by our stakeholders through this partnership with the PFC. And uh, we already have uh, four partners, one of them being Amanda Nalik, who coined teal carbon. She is from the EPA and she is on our scientific advisory board for the project. We're working with the Department of Ecology to make sure that our maps, uh, wetland maps, are already being utilized and one of our stakeholders is already presenting uh, for the NASA carbon monitoring program in about two weeks and how they're going to integrate that into their um, their work. We're working with the Forest Service, actually David Butman, my, uh, our co-PI on the project, established a joint venture agreement with a colleague in Alaska to apply some of the methods that we've already started to develop. So this is funded re research through UW to uh, start to integrate this work. And we're working with the Department of Natural Resources, Teddy Minkova on the Olympic Peninsula and Derek uh, Churchill to make sure that we get access to the field data that we need to really improve on the vi validation of the above ground uh, biomass. Lessons learned along the way, and this is really my career lessons, um, working together, you can go farther and it does take a team. Stakeholders are key, get them early, admit mistakes. These are actually opportunities. And as my now eight-year-old says, I used to say this to her when I would drop her off at daycare, I would say, get messy and have fun. And now she tells me that my job is about getting messy and having fun. So I'll leave the last word to 
Anthony Stewart and um, his field season from this summer. Hi, my name is Anthony Stewart, and I'm here to talk about our field work in the Ho Rainforest of Washington State, which is located on Quinault and Ho tribal lands. Our sampling strategy began with mapping wetland probability across the Ho Rainforest using a LiDAR-derived mapping tool. Then we selected sampling points from a range of wetlands to uplands derived from a stratification across the probability distribution. At each point we visited, we characterized the surrounding hydrology, vegetation, and landscape features, noting characteristics specific to wetlands. We then dug soil pits to at least 100 centimeters or to a confining layer and characterized the soils reflecting criteria from the NRCS. This includes defining horizons, soil color, texture, rocks and roots, and redox features. After characterization, we collected samples from each horizon, which we will process and analyze for bulk density and total carbon. These will help us calculate soil carbon stocks, and we'll use our remote sensing tools to scale our observations up to a landscape scale and further to the area of Washington. All right, so I'm going to switch modes now and formally introduce Dr. Megan Halibisky, who's a research scientist at UW within my lab. She's a lead scientist for the Conservation Science Partners Program, and she's the project lead on validation uh, for the Digital Earth Africa Program. Megan is a remote sensing scientist and a landscape ecologist who studies earth dynamic patterns and processes. Her uh, interests include development of new remote sensing techniques, for improved mapping and ha habitat inventory, spatial temporal analysis of ecosystem dynamics, monitoring landscape change and projecting climate change impacts. Her passion is working collaboratively with practitioners, policymakers, and others end users to ensure that earth observation products are fit for purpose, easily understood and ultimately have an impact. Megan has a background in conservation management and a concurrent master's from the Evans School of Public Policy and Government at the University of Washington. She has a PhD from uh, CEFS in my lab in landscape ecology and remote sensing. Most importantly, Megan is a fellow mom. She's my neighbor, shout out to 98118, and she's a mentor and a friend. So I'm going to jump into a 10 minute recorded conversation that Megan and I um, have. And I want to uh, tell you that this is a conversation about adventures and learning to confront change and challenge for underrepresented groups in geosciences. And we recognize that this is a process and a journey that we continue to learn on. So here's Megan and I. Hey, Megan. Thanks Hi, for Monica. joining me. <laughs> um, so let's jump right into it. I have three questions prepared. And the first one was, do you recall how the two of us met? Wow, that was about 10 years ago or more. Um, and I had just come back from Hawaii. I was a conservation manager focused on looking for invasive species. Um, doing more traditional field methods. And I came knocking on your door, curious about the potential for using remote sensing to find invasive species. Yeah, that's about it. And then I realized what a great opportunity you would be if you joined the lab. For me, what a great opportunity that would be. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't have any funding at the time until a few days later when I got a phone call from Sonia Hull from the Nature Conservancy asking if uh, I would be interested in looking at aerial photos, historic aerial photos to study wetland change. And I thought, well, that's not invasive species, <laughs> but wouldn't it be great if I could get Megan to come and work on this? this uh, you know, question has some policy issues related to it. I think it would be great. And then uh, you joined the Evans program and it all happened and you ended up taking on wetlands. I think I tried to sell it to you by saying, 
there are invasive species that impact <laughs> wetlands, Megan. Maybe one day we'll tackle that question. So that was uh, as far as I could stretch it, but I'm so glad that you uh, you got interested in the research and uh, came and joined the lab. Yeah, it was, I mean, it really was the perfect project because, you know, I had been a conservation manager and had been so frustrated with the kind of lack of connection between academia and on the ground, you know, applied science like conservation. And so it just seemed like that kind of perfect project to connect really cool remote sensing techniques and have it immediately be applied by folks in the Nature Conservancy. So yeah, just the perfect project. <laughs> and it sent me onto wetlands, which has been kind of the direction I've been going since. <laughs> I think I was really excited about it because I fell in love with remote sensing through historical air photos and to kind of be able to introduce another person to that and being able to look back in time through uh, air photos and kind of have a look at how the landscape is changing was was really exciting. So, okay, well, um, we've taken a few little side trips along the way as you've completed uh, a master's and a PhD in my lab. What were some of your favorite ones? That's a good question. I mean, we have taken a lot of deviations from wetlands. We've done a little bit of um, tree canopy mapping in Seattle and social trails analysis in Mount Rainier and a project in Kenya, I think, and lots of fun things. Um, I think that Kind of especially more recently the thing that's been most exciting has been developing new avenues or pathways into remote sensing you know traditionally it's been folks who have been really you know they love the technology they can just geek out on all the cool techie stuff in remote sensing but that has kind of made the number or the kinds of voices within the remote sensing community kind of narrow so trying to figure out how can we create other pathways and avenues to get more folks excited about this field and the potential for what it has to offer. And that is through the class that we taught together this summer, <laughs> Digital, Digital Earth, um, which is more of a, a class for folks without technical background to um, use remote sensing skills, learn the theory and create um, a story from it. Yeah, that was certainly exciting to kind of integrate storytelling into uh, education and think about um, our landscapes through a more diverse uh, perspective. So I, I really enjoyed having that experience with you this summer. Um, along the same lines, I noticed that in the MDPI Remote Sensing Journal, there's a new initiative that you're also involved in. Can you say a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. That is, um, so I'm a, one of the founding editors on a new section for remote sensing called Discoveries in Remote Sensing, which is trying to um, amplify existing voices and bring in new voices to our field. Um, and it's, it's a great group of women from all over the world. I got connected through this group I'm a part of called Ladies of Landsat, which is just trying to amplify um, the female voices in our field, which is, you know, takes up a, a minority of um, the scientists in our, in our field. And um, it's been a really great project. It's been fun to connect with people from all over the world that are also um, kind of organized around the same goal. And it's not just about, you know, increasing um, kind of the proportion of, of, of women in our field, but also to try and change the makeup of the editorial boards in the main journals. And so that's kind of one of the big things is looking at the main journals and remote sensing, you know, our analysis showed that, you know, all of them have um, boards comprised of 80% or more white men. And so trying to increase not just, you know, women, but also people of color and those from the global south. So it's not just kind of this one singular voice. And I think that's really where our field needs to go and could strengthen the field in general. I'm really excited about that. My pitch. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make sure the links for that will show up in the chat uh, as we do this presentation. Final question, and it's a big one. So um, other than, you know, uh, teal carbon and wetlands, what are some of the big questions or one of the big questions 
uh, that you think we can tackle together in the future? Yeah, that's, that's a, that is a big question. I mean, I think on the research side, there's so many questions to ask around the you know, topic of wetlands. It's really an understudied area in remote sensing. There's really cool discoveries to be made. Um, so of course, continuing with that is kind of a big priority, but I feel like we're in this very weird moment right now, in or maybe it's a very exciting moment in remote sensing where there's this huge data explosion. There's so much new satellite imagery coming on board cool analytics and you know, cloud computing, artificial intelligence, all of this is kind of creating this perfect storm and investment with, from a lot of startups that um, is really exciting. There's a lot of opportunity, but I also see it as um, a, a potential to increase um, the um, inequity in our field, not ju just those who are doing the science, but also those who are, have access and um, are using the science. So kind of my most, I guess, my focus kind of moving forward is to think about how we can work together to take this really cool remote sensing, you know, moment that we're having and move it outside of the ivory tower to those who can really apply it. So kind of combining remote sensing data analytics, you know, those with domain knowledge, adding in the storytelling element, but ultimately doing it all to connect with those who can make a difference and actually have impact on the ground. Um, and that includes nonprofits. I'm involved with, you know, conservation science partners, as you know, that that really does that kind of work, um, connecting with practitioners on the ground to interpret the data. I also work with Digital Earth Africa, which is trying to provide data infrastructure and governance um, with partners in Africa, not just for partners in Africa. So the with, not for. Um, uh, am I forgetting any other projects? <laughs> I mean, uh, well, um, I, I think along the same lines, I'm just as excited as you about <laughs> where remote sensing is at. I really didn't think some of the innovations that have happened in the last year would be happening till much later in my career. And I'm sensing this opportunity to start the, to think about our environments and uh, using hyperspatial, hyperspectral, hypertemporal remote sensing and all of these amazing tools to start to test uh, ecological hypotheses that allow, allow us to really understand landscape uh, ecological resilience, but also human resilience and even merging those uh, those two things together. So I think we have plenty of fun adventures ahead of us. Thanks, yeah, I, Megan. Can I add one thing to that, yeah, Monica? For sure. Yeah, I feel like uh, for those who aren't familiar with remote sensing, the computer scientists have discovered our field and they're doing a lot of cool stuff, but it's just what you said. It's like connecting it, you know, with this strong domain knowledge and scientific expertise to answer some really you know, exciting and cutting edge questions that could have impact on the ground and making sure we're doing it with, um, you know, in a way that's inclusive of all voices. Yeah. So yeah, that definitely is exciting. So thanks, Monica. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Megan. And thanks as always for helping me grow and see uh, things in a new perspective. It's always uh, amazing how a student can become a mentor and I really appreciate having that opportunity. Talk to you later. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you, Monica. All right. Well, um, I'm going to finish off here. As you heard, um, a lot of my work is about connections and uh, connections, I think, are key. There are co connections over landscapes, over time. As one of my favorite poets, Wiesława Szymborska, who's uh, a Nobel Prize winner and a Polish poet, uh, wrote a poem about water. And the poem goes through how water connects time and space. I encourage you to, uh, to read it. Well, here's another 
final connection and this is a, a connection over time and I feel like we've skipped a generation where Megan as uh, my student couldn't study invasive species but Megan and I had an opportunity just uh, a few months ago to work with an undergraduate student working on a capstone looking at invasive species in wetlands so those connections are there they're amazing they keep us going um, and uh, we look forward to having more of them. That's all I have, um, and I am open for questions. And so is Megan, she's on live with me. Thank you, Monica and Megan. Um, do we have any, I don't see any questions from the Q&A or in the chat, but if you have any questions, um, Maybe I'll um, start by saying uh, or asking a kind of because I am the kind of geeky kind of person who likes to hear some of the technical details. What is the um, sort of key um, data source or analytical tool that you guys have found to be useful in the highly accurate prediction of wetland? patterns that has become sort of this core to your project? Why, why have you been so successful in that? Okay, I, I will answer it from my perspective and I think Megan can jump in as well. I feel like um, having a structural dimension in being able to predict wetlands is key. And in remote sensing, wherever you get that structural dimension being aerial lidar, spaceborne lidar that you extrapolate onto the landscape, or being digital photogrammetry structural data. Um, that's where I think you gain success in these predictive models. But that's my, you know, bird's eye view of it. Megan sits in, um, in the system, works with the actual tool. So Megan, what are your thoughts? Well, I am definitely a student of Monica's where I follow that triangle where it's, there's no one answer. It's all the, all of the tools together combined <laughs> is the answer. But if I'm going to answer for Washington State, I think the two tools that I find really useful are on the west side because we have trees that don't lose their leaves, really hard to find the wetlands in the first place. So LIDAR, which is an active sensor, can go through the canopy, can give us that really fine scale digital train model. We can mimic where the, the water flows, that is absolutely key at finding wetlands. And that's been a huge game changer for our state in finding where the wetlands are in the first place. On the east side of the state, where you have these open systems, you know, open canopy and really super dynamic, you know, they're flooding and drying, you know, throughout the year and over many years and trying to understand the, the water flooding patterns you know, the key to that has been the Landsat archive and unlocking, you know, 40 years of change, you know, every couple of weeks has been amazing to understand kind of what's going on over there. Thanks, Megan. That sort of raises another question for me if um, nobody's gonna put questions in the chat, um, but feel free to, if you're listening and you have a question. Um, Wetlands are really dynamic systems, and how do you think? How do you think about um, sort of mapping wetlands and characterizing wetland carbon? Are you is there some particular definition like you're trying to meet the National Wetland Inventory definition of wetlands, and therefore then characterize all the carbon, whether it's wet or not, at a particular point in time? Then you have to kind of um, characterize that dynamic in order to w determine whether it meets that definition, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. So that that question of what is a wetland, what isn't, is really, really hard. And there's about 500 different classifications you can use. You know, I mean, I always think of wetlands as the space between the upland and the, you know, permanently flooded deep water aquatic. It kind of encompasses everything in between. So things can be flooded, you know, in a tradition, you know, I guess the NWI might say it is flooded for two weeks out of the growing season. It's a wetland all the way to it's permanently flooded up to two meters. I think what we're taking for teal garbage is not the strict definition, but really sampling along the continuum, um, you know, 
kind of getting to understand that that how that change in inundation impacts carbon above ground and below ground carbon. Yeah, to me, it also um, brings in the component of the stakeholder because different stakeholders see these landscapes and their different functions. And sometimes you have to constrain the question based on what the stakeholder actually needs. Great, so we do have a question from the Q&A from Sarah who writes, Hi, Monica. I was wondering if you could explain a bit more about your work in modeling heterogeneous forests with an ecosystem view. How is that different from using a productivity view? Hmm. It isn't. I mean, the two are connected. I think um, I see it as a classical remote sensing scientist, and I see uh, forests looking different during different seral stages, but those seral stages are clearly tied to productivity as well. So uh, the two, to me, are completely integrated, or need to be. Okay. Yeah, I mean, productivity is an ecosystem characteristic. Yeah. So it, it would seem difficult to disentangle that. <laughs> it's a function, and structure is such a big component of that function. So if you can't get at structure, you're not really able to look at that. Leaf area index, but I'm not going to go there today. That's a completely different research topic that I love, but um, it's a different thing. So have you guys, um, Chad is the one who's sampling the carbon in the wetlands? No, it's us. Chad is our um, uncertainty expert. So he helps us design the um, field uh, point protocols to make sure that we're capturing statistically viable samples to be able to answer uh, or account for error and uncertainty. But it's um, actually a uh, Megan's been out there and Anthony Stewart, our um, new PhD student that just started, he came uh, on during the summer and spent some, some time already and began a field season under COVID to, uh, to begin that below ground uh, carbon sampling. So have you um, started to get a sense of uh, maybe you don't have results yet of how much carbon you're seeing in these wetlands and where it's more and where it's less? I think well, it's hard to say on the number of samples that we had, which is 10 <laughs> locations, but we're definitely seeing that um, the upland uh, wetlands have um, more um, sandy, less organic material in it, and the riparian lowland wetlands or uh, sites have um, the organic soils and materials. Um, I think uh, as we speak, as you know, Dan, Anthony's been asking for access to SEPs because he's beginning to process, dry out our samples and process for, uh, for carbon there. We need more field samples. Our field season was definitely truncated. We thought we would be um, much farther uh, this summer. Uh, we are hoping that we can revisit or um, go back to some of uh, the locations and uh, have a larger field season next summer. So for now, we're going to focus on the above ground and um, making sure that we really uh, see how the products from Andy Hudak's uh, research, who's actually on the board of the PFC and had another funded proposal, we didn't know he was going to be funded, uh, how he, his maps are um, able to account for some of the uncertainty in these harder to work with riparian zones. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Anthony chimes in that wetland soils are carbon rich, but also deep. <laughs> right. <clears throat> so I see another question. Is there an opportunity to volunteer? Um, I think there might be. You see my email at the bottom there? Make sure you email me and uh, we will be hiring a field crew next summer. We're really hoping that we can get students, undergrads. Uh, we actually have already had a hired undergrad who went out with Anthony. We're hoping that students that have soil experience can join us uh, summer 2021. And it's not just volunteer, we'll, we'll pay you for it to come and uh, help Anthony uh, dig soil pits. <laughs> Great. Well, um, not seeing any other questions. I think we would ordinarily uh, retire to the back of the room for some refreshments, but um, for now, we'll have to um, we'll have to leave it there and uh, thank you both for your presentation and um, look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. Take care. Thanks.